A little bit about what's e what is ESA and why we did eSurge. Satellite requirements, some of the requirements that are uh, relevant uh, to what we're doing with storm surges and the, and the instruments that we have, and examples. And, and the idea of the talk is really to give you a flavor of what is possible. So really the lesson goal is to get a flavor of the opportunities that satellite instrument measurements, because we're dealing with instruments, these are measurements, provide to storm surge applications. So it's for you to think how you can make use of this information in, in your daily work. Now, Roy told me to say something about myself as well, so that's me. I do a bit of sailing, play guitar, and quite like ballooning, not that I do very much of it, but it's good fun. And I work at ESA, so European Space Agency, and our Article 2 says that we're here as an organisation, an intergovernmental organisation, to try to provide for and promote, for exclusively peaceful purposes, cooperation among European states for space research technology and their applications. So we build satellites and we try to demonstrate through research and development how to apply the data to promulgate its use. And that's really what we're into. A beautiful image taken from the cupola which was built by ESA and uh, deployed on the space station. It's got windows so the astronauts can see for the first time out of the space station and they like to spend time up there. But it's a brilliant image of the Bahamas. And really, it's an unenviable village. It's brilliant. I mean, you can just sit there and you can learn so much about the ocean, about the coastline, uh, just by looking at, at images. You don't need to do any more. I mean, there's great science to be done and we do a lot of that. But at ESA we also do a lot of interplanetary work. We have missions looking to space, trying to land on comets, uh, exploring Venus and Mars. We also have our own astronauts. We have uh, and have serviced through five missions uh, the space station itself. Uh, we develop launchers. We have a spaceport in French Guiana. And we have a communications and telecommunications and integrated applications program where we try to bring many of these different aspects together. And of course, uh, where I work in Earth observation. So it's quite an interesting space agency in that we cover this great gamut of different things. Fascinating place to work at. I really enjoy my, what I do. And I encourage you, if you get a chance, to come and have a look at one of our establishments. It's good fun. So we're 20 member states. We have uh, new members. Of, uh, uh, from Poland and Romania and uh, Slovenia is one of our uh, cooperation uh, states. So. But why I'm here really is to think about storm surges and what they really mean and how you could use satellite data. It's a brilliant picture from the BBC. Uh, I'm not sure if these are people or if they're birds, but I'm not sure I'd like to be there. Part of me would like to be there, but the other part of me wouldn't like to be there. But really, the intense power of the ocean when it meets the coast and its destructive capability is enormous. This is actually a race, so this is wind against tide. I wouldn't like to be out sailing in that. Um, this is the same, uh, same St. Jude's storm. But you can see as well, of course, the destruction uh, and the problems that uh, people come under when, they have, uh, when they're exposed to this kind of weather. So when we started eSurge, the research that we did, we tried to find various uh, information sources to understand where the threat of storm surges was. So in 2006, six, there was a European uh, Union uh, activity and they mapped out where the most vulnerable areas were for storm surge around Europe. And some of these have changed subsequent to the release of, uh, of this document. And I just put on the side there um, several little images from the North Sea floods, the UK East Coast of 2007 and December 2012. And again, of course, you've heard a lot already about the 2013 storms. But really, e-surge is about trying to address how to use the satellite data to improve the operational systems and the R&D that underpins the operational systems. Because in order to run and maintain a storm surge forecasting capability, you're only as good as um, the research and the development that underpins your operational system. So it's research and operations. These two go hand in hand. And um, for 60 years in the Met services, this is how it's worked in an oceanography. Um, this is starting now, but it's the research and the operations together that make the difference. I think this has been said before, but 44% of the human population are located within 150 kilometers of the coast. Many of the largest cities are there, and we have this migration towards the coast. And of course, in Europe, we have many areas that are well below sea level, particularly where I live in the Netherlands. So it's quite interesting to work on this. 2013, again, 6th of December, you can see the, uh, the warnings that were issued for the UK coastline 
plenty of them, and indeed um, several of those areas suffered a significant surge with damage um, and uh, dislocation of people. That's actually the surge itself. Um, this is at Lowestoft, which is on the east coast. And you can see the surge here showing up in the long-term records here from November 2013 through to December 2013, so it's a month there. Uh, zooming in a little bit, you can see in the, in the data the, the skew surge that's been discussed. And it's quite, it's quite a surge for that part of the world, which is very low-lying. It's a bit like Holland, actually, the east coast of the UK. Very, very flat, very, very similar. Even got windmills there. But the destruction is, is immense. I mean, here you see a sort of picture before and after in, uh, in the UK. And you can see this huge island has been taken apart by the power of the sea. This stack here completely destroyed. So we're really talking about an immense amount of power. And of course, that leads to an immense amount of problems for the people that live quite close to the coast. And indeed, people like to live by the coast. They like the sea breeze. They like to look at the sea. Uh, but when it gets like this, it's not the place that you really want to be. But I think these pictures are very important, not just politically, but they're important to motivate us all as scientists to get the most out of uh, the tools and the data sets that we have. Because in the end, that's really what it's about. How can we help those people prepare so that perhaps they're not being pulled out in a boat at the very last minute, but they've been moved out before. So what can we see? Well, um, if we think the tropical cyclones, here I show an image taken from the MODIS satellite. It's a visible image, so it's, um, do you know, it's color. And you can see very, very clearly uh, Falin, Nari, and Wipa all showing up nightly and nicely there in three consecutive passes on the same day. So we have very, very good coverage. And these data are available at a resolution of 250 meters in many different spectral bands. And when you look at these data, you might think about taking a photograph with a camera. It really is like that. You're looking at the reflected uh, um, uh, signal from the sun, and that's what you're measuring. So you can see very, very clearly that the storms, and you can see the background images quite a lot. Go to synthetic aperture radar, and you start invoking uh, different techniques to map flood and inundation. Um, you can see here, this is actually a map that's prepared as part of the Space Disasters Charter, where all the space agencies work together to provide emergency maps by retasking satellites on, on demand to look at major disasters. And this was done by the Indian Space Agency. And here they're looking at damages in part of Bar Town from uh, Radar Site, a Canadian uh, um, uh, with a synthetic aperture radar and India's own reset. But these kind of information, if they can be got out in, in near real time as fast as possible, available to the disaster managers that are actually on the ground, can be really make a big difference. They can see immediately where the problems are and start to actually deploy uh, help and resources to resolve the situation. Scatterometry, this is from the eSurge website. This is the kind of information you can bring up very, very quickly. And really, I think, you know, for storm surges, it's a key instrument. Providing wind vector information, the resolution and the level of detail uh, that you can see from the scatterometer is fundamental. It's a workhorse instrument for storm surges. But you can see here this is ASCAT, and ASCAT has quite a large gap in between the two uh, swaths of the instrument here. Actually, that's because uh, the way the antennas are set out here, and I'll touch a little bit about this in a second, um, what you have is you have to look at the sea surface at particular angles because you're looking for specific backscatter characteristics from the roughness, the small waves sitting on the big waves, the so-called brag waves. And the scatterometer responds to that. The radar energy is reflected off the sea surface surface and depending on the roughness more or less of that radar energy makes its way back uh, to the space and by having three beams looking at slightly different angles different cuts then you can resolve the ambiguities in the signal this is uh, the OSCAT instrument this works quite in quite a, di a different way this has a scanning antenna and so this scanning antenna allows you to fill the full swath um, in a different way from the ASCAP, which has its fixed beams. But again, you can see here quite nicely the data sets that you can get, get straight away from uh, the eSurge website. Fundamental workhorses. It's a little picture there, and it's this antenna that's rotating at a fixed angle. So as I mentioned, uh, what is a radar? A radar, a bit like a flash camera. When you take a, fa a, a photograph with your camera, you get a flash. <laughs> That energy is um, bounced off your target and your camera records um, the image. And that's really what you're doing with, uh, with a radar um, system. You're sending out your energy 
and it's interacting with the sea surface at these very, very small uh, three, three centimeter waves in C-band in this case. And depending on the roughness, you get a variable max scatter. So you imagine if this was completely flat, most of your energy just flies away. So you get very small signals. If you have rough surfaces, then you get a variability. And it's that variability that allows us to relate roughness measured by a radar to what the wind is doing at 10 meters height. But there's a transfer function there. The scatterometer does not measure wind. It infers wind from the roughness measurements of the ocean surface. But the ambiguities that you get with the scatterometer are that depending how and what angles you view the sea surface, if you've got swell waves, then the backscatter changes as you've got these bigger swell waves with the little waves that you're responding to with the radar. And therefore, over a 360 degree relatively, relative wind direction in your signal, you get these ambiguities. And this is why you need those three beams. And you have the same thing with your scanning uh, radar. It's just that you can take multiple cuts there. Anyway, quick introduction to radar, and I won't go any further than that for the time being. With eSurge, we're aware that there were lots, there were lots of data out there. So how do we get this data into a shape and a format that's exciting enough and useful enough for forecasters and other teams to want to make use of the data? Because if you've got a forecasting system and you're committed to a certain time and date to deliver your forecast, you don't really want to break your system by using this new data. Of course you have to, you have to run a research um, system in parallel with your operational system to test new ideas. But of course, with a storm surge forecasting system, you have a legal responsibility in many cases because you're dealing with people's lives and their property. So, of course, when you start to introduce something new, you typically make your system worse and it takes several months or even years to actually understand how to get the most out of uh, the new changes that you've made. So it's a difficult challenge and that's what eSearch is starting to do uh, uh, right from the very start. So one of the things was, look, all this data is out there, it's all in, different, it's all in a different format. If you're a scatterometer guy, you get a more complicated format than if you're a synthetic aperture radar guy or a visible guy. So one of the things that we were asked to do is to try to put things into a common format and allow people to get at that data quite easily. And the project's done that, and they've produced a historical database of case studies that can be used by all of you. It's open and all the data are available. But that's no good on its own. You need also to have the documentation to enable you to use that data. And if you go into the satellite industry, wow, we do documentation. We do documentation about this high, actually, from the table. It's great. But no one's ever going to read it. So one of the things that we're asked to do in the project was to try to translate this sort of 60 centimeter high load of, of paper into something that was much more accessible by people like yourselves, where you really can get to grips with what you need to know to get hold of the data and make it work for you. The best way to deliver this data, we were told, was to put it onto the web, which we've done, but together with training, which we're doing here, but also online training, as well as bits of code to help you read and manipulate the data. And then to perform some impact assessments and to try to provide a near real-time service for certain aspects. And I'll touch on various bits of that as we go through the presentation. So ESA provides quite a lot of support to storm surges. There's just a few things here and later at your leisure have a look perhaps through some of these websites to find out about satellites and some of the other projects that we run. Well, primarily we're into building satellites, big, complicated, pretty expensive satellites with very complicated instruments on board. And I say complicated because they have to be. You build one of these things on the ground, you test it, test it, test it, test it, test it, and then you strap it to a big firework and you shake it to hell and fling it up into space. And somehow you hope that this thing's working. And it's not like you can open the door and just go and tweak the knobs once it's gone. You can't get at it. So it's really extensive, exhaustive program of shaking the thing, of cycling the thing in thermal vacuum chambers, and really trying to make sure that you understand everything before you let go of your baby. And you can see some of these satellites, these are people, are pretty big. This is Envisat, in fact. And this satellite here is, is Gotche, which measures uh, gravity. What do we need for storm surges? Key measurement requirements well, we need total water level envelope. That's been mentioned before in the coastal zone. That's what we're interested in. We need storm track and intensity. Uh, we need the nearshore wind fields. We need the wave heights. We need the surface water levels, at least one minute average values. As Ag was pointing out, the spatio-temporal differences matter, as particularly when you're forecasting. Surface pressure at the least pressure drop. 
we need surface currents because we need to understand the interaction with the winds and the currents. And we need sea surface temperature, vertical temperature profiles, sea surface height anomalies to actually enable us to control our ocean model in the first place. It's kind of like the background. So there's quite a lot of information there. Well, what can we do from space? Um, what, we're at, what we have is we have an altimeter, which is a simpler radar than a um, scatterometer. Here we have a single radar pulse that is emitted from the bottom of the satellite vertically down. And you look, and you look for the return pulses back. The principles of interaction with the, with the sea surface are the same, more or less. But you're looking for that pulse of energy rather than actually producing an image. So you get an along track data set. But we'll talk a bit more about that because that's extremely useful because it does actually provide you with an actual measurement of the total water level envelope, depending on the datum to which you reference the satellite data to. So while we have a theoretical world um, geoid, and we have a model of that, WGS84, actually on the ground, trying to reconcile your tide gauge measurements to your satellite measurements is a major issue. And there's a whole task out there to do what's called height unification, trying to understand how to make sure that when you say it's this in the US, we mean the same thing in Europe. Today we don't. And actually it's very interesting because actually if you look at the, 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 the data on the ground uh, across the US from Miami up towards uh, Canada, so you go south to north, what you find is the leveling data show that it's all nice and flat and all homogeneous. But actually when you start using new gravity data from space together with ocean modeling, you find that it doesn't work. And there's actually a tilt. And Miami's uh, a little bit lower uh, than it should be. So in reality, Miami is a bit lower than the datums are suggesting. But scatterometers we've talked about, synthetic aperture radi radars, uh, synthetic aperture radar again interacting with the sea surface in a similar way by looking at the backscatter. But here, what you do as you fly your satellite, you synthesize, you make up uh, a very, very large antenna by looking at the timing of the pulses. So you in fact make an artificial antenna and this allows you to produce an image uh, at very, very high resolution, uh, tens of uh, a few meters in fact, with very, very high uh, uh, you can see trains and cars and this kind of thing, but also you can see a lot of information over the sea surface and including uh, the derivation of a, of a wave spectrum. So that allows you to give you directional information from space, which is very interesting. You can also look at, uh, depending which frequency of radar you use, you can look at uh, different swell characteristics in the coastal zone. Um, so that's very interesting, we'll touch a little bit on that. Then you've got passive microwave radiometers, which are looking at the, uh, the microwave natural emissions from the sea surface. And that allows you to look at winds, at sea surface temperatures, and at sea ice. And we'll touch a bit on that as well. Then we have thermal infrared radiometers, so thermal infrared, heat, uh, and what you sense is that heat emission from the sea surface gives you temperature. And from that you can deduce storm tracks, because quite typically a large tropical cyclone will leave a cold wake due to the Ekman upwelling, uh, due to the intense turbulence that's imparted uh, into the sea surface. So you'll see this nice cold wake, so that's quite helpful. Um, as you see uh, passage of the, of the cyclone. And visible images, again, you can see the cloud top pressures and you can see the position of the storm and its size. Very, very important information for forecasters for verification of models in particular. But also it allows you in the coastal zone because you've got reasonable high resolution and some satellites in the panchromatic, so black and white, go down to one or two meters. You can actually look at before and after images and look at inundation maps. Um, so there's a lot of work that can be done there to assist in storm surges. Our fleet of satellites started in uh, 1980 and we've built many different satellites for many different purposes. We work a lot with UMITSAT and we build satellites for them to run in the operational world as well as we have our own Earth Explorer missions which are looking at novel concepts and more difficult things that perhaps aren't fully proven yet. So we're really exploring what we can do from space. And uh, we're just on the cusp of a revolution in satellites for Earth observation in Europe through what are called Sentinel missions as part of the European Union's uh, Copernicus program. And we'll touch a little bit on that so you know what's coming up. So starting in 91, we had ERS-1, we had an altimeter, we had a scatterometer, synthetic aperture radar, and some uh, visible and thermal infrared 
uh, images. And this was really where ESA was learning how to do its business. And a whole host of different things were produced here. Some of the first images of oil slicks. And I say this because some of this information is relevant to storm surges. After the surge, when you've, had, when you've got the retreat of water, there's a whole load of debris, as you know, that's, uh, that's moved out and the whole landscape has changed. Things start drifting, including oil. So this is kind of information that you can use in the aftermath of a surge. Um, but we have a mean dynamic topography, which is the, um, the part of the sea surface elevation beyond the geoid, which gives rise to geostrophic currents. So you have a little hump of water with a gravitational potential, which allows the water to move. And because Coriolis and the Earth is spinning, then you actually get a flow. So this was some of the first dynamic topography maps, and over the years we've built those up to be quite sophisticated and very accurate topography maps, proven by comparisons with um, um, gravity missions. They show the same things. Sea surface temperatures and some experiments with uh, scatterometry beyond the CSAT mission, which the US launched in 1978. Then we launched Envisat in 2002, about the size of a double-decker bus. Huge satellite, very, very big, carrying a whole host of different instruments here. But here we could start to look in the visible at a 300 meter resolution. So to, uh, um, total suspended matter, very important in the aftermath of, of storm surges to understand what's going on with flows and redistribution of sediments. Uh, also, you can get at chlorophyll and water transparency amongst many other things. But of course you can get to these nice beautiful time series with the non-flash camera, uh, if you like, through visible imagery, showing you the path of the storms. Um, very, very important information. It looks simple here, but actually imagine a world where you couldn't see this. And that world did once exist before 1978 when we launched Tyros, the Americans launched Tyros N. And at that point, uh, meteorologists went, aha, that's how it works, because you could get this synoptic picture. And we hadn't really had that before. We got Burkane's model, we understood how frontal systems worked, we got some in-situ measurements. But until we got some of these images where you just went, oh, yes, we got it right. It was kind of always a bit of a debate on how these things and big systems worked. If you go to the thermal infrared, here's a picture of the UK, you can still see clouds, but you don't need um, the sun. So you can, you can, you can image 24-7. Uh, a workhorse for most of the Met centers on understanding what's going on with, um, with meteorology. If we then go to the synthetic aperture radar, and here there are three images, uh, the same data using different processing models. You can see here the eye of this storm. And this is the backscatter, uh, and there's a gradient across here due to the illumination angle of the radar itself. But from that information, you can actually derive a wind field. You need prior information to give you directional information. Uh, but you also, from the Doppler shift between the, of, the, of the waves, you can derive an estimate of one component of the current vector, the ocean current vector, which you can see here. So from the same instrument, you get an, you get an idea of what the wind is doing, you get an idea of what the currents are doing. Then if you start to think about combining that with your visible data sets, uh, so you can see the, 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 the scope and the scale of the storm um, and its dynamics, because just by actually looking at the shape and characteristics of these clouds here, which have been flung out at the top of the, uh, of the system, you can actually really start to get a feel of the intensity. And you can actually apply algorithms looking at the O2, uh, the oxygen absorption bands in the atmosphere to derive an estimate of cloud top pressure and therefore its height. So from space you can do quite a lot to understand the characteristics of not just tropical cyclones as shown here but also the mesoscale, uh, the um, synoptic storms uh, at our latitudes. Sea surface temperature, again, fundamental, and it's fundamental not because it creates beautiful imagery, which it does, and also sea surface temperature is a conservative property, but because it's one of the elements that you can use together with altimetry to understand the ocean's heat content. And it's heat, it's, uh, and from that you can derive a quantity which has become called the tropical cyclone heat potential, which gives you an estimate of how much energy there's available in the ocean upper layer to feed a big storm. And you can see here in this case, which is Katrina, as the storm came in, it intensified over this area of high tropical heat potential. So very, very important information. This is a combination of a little bit of sea surface temperature, but also altimetry, because obviously when you warm the ocean up, it expands and it rises. So there's a steric height component there. More that we can do with the altimeter, we can do the sea surface heights, we can do tides uh, at certain frequencies, uh, we can do the mean sea level and the wind and waves. 
Um, this has been shown before. Just to give you a perspective, this is where the altimeter data set starts relative to the long-term record. But actually, when you look at the details here, it's quite fascinating because there are many instruments of completely different designs, similar principles, flying on different satellites in slightly different orbits. But they all tell a reasonably consistent story that we have a significant sea level rise, 3.2 millimeters per year, derived from all these different instruments. And of course, I just point to what Kevin talked about this morning, uh, the recent uh, publication by the Met Office, which implies that what we saw um, just recently is consistent with what's expected in a warmer world. But you can also actually see the, st the surge itself. Again, this is Katrina, and there are two passes here of Jason satellite. And what you're looking at in this one here is you're looking at the significant wave height, and you're looking at the wind speed, and you're looking at the sea level anomaly. And as these passes uh, go through the storm, you can see the bulge. You can actually see and measure the bulge of water uh, that's induced by the low pressure uh, and also the other um, characteristics of, 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 of the storm quite clearly from the altimeter. But of course the big problem you have with altimetry is that you only get this one little you get this one little shot which is anywhere between 2 and uh, 20 kilometers wide depending on the sea state and that's it. So there's no fancy image here. There's just a very accurate cut straight through the storm. And one of the challenges is we will never have the 60 or 70 altimeter systems that we need to properly sample here um, these kind of storms. And one of the challenges is how do we make use of this sparse data in the work that we do for storm surges? It's a challenge. Uh, there's particular challenges in the coastal zone because, as you know, when you look out across the coastal, from the coastal headland at the sea, you've got the steady, nice ocean out in the distance. But in the coastal zone, you've got currents, you've got wind uh, effects from the land. You've got all sorts of things going, interactions with the, the sea floor and interactions with the coastline. So the altimeter really struggles to actually make good measurements uh, without very careful quality control and special processing in the coastal zone. But there's a whole team that works on this, led by Paolo Cipollini and Jerome Benveniste and others, that are really trying hard now to get the best out of the altimeter. Just to give you an idea of how complex some of the data are, across this uh, swath here, uh, you can see, um, you can start to pick out the details from the Bonifacio Strait here and here. In the operational data streams, you can't get hold of that data. It's flagged out. It's land. So it's only by going to the very high resolution data sets that you can do this. And that's really starting to take a lot of, uh, starting to move very quickly there. So from the ERS-1 satellite, the ERS-2, the EMISAT satellite, and some of the others that I've mentioned here, there's really thousands of projects and activities that have taken place uh, over the last few years. So it's really, all of this data is available. There's lots of information on the ESA website and also the UMETSAT website and other space agencies. And once you start digging in, you'll find that it's really fascinating and lots of information to help you. So I mentioned that we also run research satellites, uh, and here we have the one called the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity Mission. And this is a passive microwave radiometer. It's an interferometer, actually, with 69 smaller radi radiometers that are used together to synthesize a very large aperture. Because at 1.4 gigahertz, you'd need a real antenna that was about 10 meters in diameter. And that's really hard to get in space. And it's really hard to maintain the shape of such an antenna when you're in space, especially if you've shaken it on a rocket. But the idea here is to try and measure salinity because there is a salinity response at 1.4 gigahertz. It's very complicated. You see all sorts of weird stuff. Again, our beautiful sea surface with all the lovely waves on there that give us real nightmares because reflected at the sea surface at Elbound, you get the galaxy, you get the moon, you get the sun, you get the strong stars. Plus you get changes through Faraday rotation of the emissions from the sea surface as it passes through the ionosphere. Very, very, very complicated. Plus, we get radio frequency interference from a whole host of different things at, at Elban, starting with traffic lights right the way up to military radars. Very challenging, but nevertheless, you can now get global salinity maps with an accuracy of about 0.2 to 0.4 uh, uh, salinity units um, over the uh, 10 day resolution. So for the first time, we have really good salinity maps challenging but useful. 
The real challenge is now to interpret these because actually when you go to oceanographers, they don't have enough data to tell us whether or not we see a rain signal or we're seeing noise. So it's a beautiful project here to actually make sense of the data that are coming from SMOS. Now that's useful for storm surges because you can use this as a boundary for your hydrodynamic ocean model. But something else that L-band does is it allows you to see the emissions from a very rough sea surface and a very complicated sea surface. And at L-band, what you actually see is something that we've termed the excess of emissivity. So you get an enhanced emission at the sea surface under very, very, very rough turbulent conditions. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about that. That's the sea surface, a photograph taken from an aircraft in near hurricane force winds. And you can see there's plenty of sea spray. There's beautiful. I mean, all of this stuff is just water being flung around all over the place. There aren't many waves left anymore, in fact, because they've all been blown flat. There's just water flying everywhere. And when you start thinking about it, you've got water as aerosols. You've got little bits of white caps being blown away as spume. And you've got this turbulent two-phase mixture of air and seawater. And it's this kind of strange mixture that gives rise to this excess emissivity signal that you can see at L-band. And actually, if you take SMOS data and you plot this as a function of um, uh, the surface wind speed, and I think this is, uh, this is actually derived from uh, the uh, step, uh, step frequency microwave uh, radiometer that I had mentioned earlier, plus also some other data sets here, the PALS Alban radiometer also, what you find is that the, for SMOS, the geophysical model transfer function has a neat little kink at about 33 meters per second here, where this excess emissivity and all the foam starts to be flung around, and you get this secondary gradient here. So you have two signals here, something's happening at the sea surface at this point. <laughs> And what you find, actually, is that when you look at where you get a change from 11 to, uh, force 11 to force 12, it's at roughly 33 meters per second. So that's quite a nice result. And there's a project that's running now to produce a, a long-term database over the entire SMOS mission of all of the events that we have together with other satellite data to verify that this actually is the case. And we can use this to get at these very, very high winds, which will be really, really useful, particularly as at L-band you can see through clouds. So we can really get at something useful. And actually, when you start looking at the small state, you can find there's a lot of structure in the winds that you see there. Even though they're snapshots taken over a few, micros, uh, uh, a few uh, uh, microseconds as the satellite flies, nevertheless, you can see uh, we have a couple of cases where you can see eye reformation, eye wall reformation characteristics and particular features. Really fantastic data, but brand new. Um, so this is, uh, this is the, the high-end storm, and we had some good passes uh, here and one bit further up there. So this is actually adding, adding to, to the suite of measurements that are used. And here's just uh, one, one uh, example of verification of the SMOS data. The SMOS winds are shown in black dots here against the, uh, the best estimates from a variety of different sources, from the AMSU. Uh, uh, data sets from the best track and from the combined of all uh, the SATCOM analysis. So SMOS is doing okay. There's still some more work to do, but it's not doing too badly. We also have a, an Explorer mission called Cryosat 2, which is dedicated to trying to understand uh, how, the, how the, the ice sheets are, are, are changing, also over sea ice, and it carries a synthetic aperture radar altimeter. Now, this means that you can synthesize very, very, uh, very, very sharp, a long track sampling. So you can sample at 300 meter resolution, albeit in a very narrow uh, 2 to 25 kilometer swath. Uh, it's a very neat in instrument. It's actually an interferometer uh, for the ice, but I won't talk about that now. But it allows you to get this high resolution long track. And when you do that over the ocean, the difference between a conventional altimeter sampling, which is shown here, which is called low resolution mode, what we're looking at here is power. Uh, what I want you to concentrate on is the, is the oblateness, the, the, the blockiness of this plot. This is the typical kind of sampling that you would get from conventional altimeters. Uh, but once you go to the SAR mode, you can see an awful lot more structure, which is much more uh, useful for us to work with in terms of reducing noise and getting the most out of the altimeter. And there's a lot of work that's taking place here. But you can use also the altimeter to get at significant wave heights over storms. And here you can see three examples. And that gives you a global picture, quasi-synoptic quasi over certain areas. 
um, the orbit repeat rate of cryosat is tuned to um, to measure to, to sample in the Arctic and the Antarctic ice regions and so therefore you don't get optimal ocean coverage but I'll talk a little bit later about the, about the missions the new missions that we have which are optimized for the ocean with their altimetry we also have some examples of where we've actually measured um, the total water level envelope during storm surges and this is actually in the Kattegat the pass is coming here and what you can see here is the water level in this area here is, is quite high and you can see the surge here as the water is piled up in this region oh, well we also have examples from uh, another mission called Altica which is a uh, Indian uh, French collaboration that carries an instrument called SARAL and again here you can see the total water level envelope and the water that's been piled up in the German Bight here quite clearly so there is real signal here and even if you used it in a relative sense, this is useful for the work that we do. It could be a verification, it can be a validation. The trick is how do we get this data into a shape and a form where we can make the most out of that. Uh, well, here's an example of uh, Cyclone Mahan, Mahazen. And, and this area doesn't have very many tide gauges because when they put the tide gauges up and the next cyclone comes along, it just takes them all out again. So it's this like painting the fourth road bridge, a very big bridge in the UK, where once you've painted the bridge, you start again at the other end. And that, that's pretty much similar to what you have here. But you can see where the storm made landfall in this region here and when we go to our altimetry tracks these are the tracks that we got but we didn't get them at exactly the right place and we didn't get them at exactly the right date but what you can see here is you can see some signal in this track here and not much in these ones okay but that's fine but that's the kind of sampling that you get and when you look at the waveforms you can see here that you do indeed actually see the surge as the altimeter moves on to the coastline where we had landfall so these are virtual tide gauges, in other words. Now they need to be calibrated and they need to be maintained in a consistent manner with the actual tide gauges on the ground. But they are, in fact, virtual tide gauges. Here's another example of Hurricane Isaac. If we look at the Jason passes, the Jason altimeter passes, you can see the sampling that you get typically over a 10-day period. Um, and this is what we get from cryosat and as i mentioned before the sampling and orbit characteristics of cryosat are not optimized for this neat coverage even though this is quite a large area it's optimized to make very fine uh, measurements over the ice which is why the tracks are so close together but nevertheless when the data are there we almost have an obligation to use it well quickly moving on that gives you a flavor of some of the core workhorse satellite sensors and instruments and the data sets that you can get and work with for storm surges but what's coming next it's fine you might say Craig great so you've got this nice satellite called SMOS and you've got one of them what are you going to do when it fails well it's a good point we have to demonstrate that it makes use and then we can go back to our member states and find more money to demonstrate that we need that to prolong uh, another mission but we do have a program called Comber Copernicus which is launching starting in April this year uh, six satellites that are directly relevant to storm surges Sentinel-1 which is two satellites uh, as, a, as a synthetic aperture radar Sentinel-2 which is a high resolution multi-spectral imaging mission and Sentinel-3 which is for global and ocean land monitoring and these will be continued by B and C units so we have a series of four satellites in each of these different uh, categories so 12 satellites in all for the oceanographic uh, relevant data sets to storm surges over the next 20 years so we have sustainability in terms of capability and this gives you a, a picture of Sentinel-1 this is now being packed up it's uh, ready for launch it's been finally tested running very quickly and everyone's very excited at ESA because when this instrument is launched there's a whole range of applications that will be uh, addressed Top of the list for us is wave spectral information from the synthetic aperture radar. By, provide, by using a largely empirical model to look at the characteristics of the backscatter, you can derive wave spectral information. So that gives you the intensity and, if you like, um, uh, the direction of, of the waves. Very, very important information for what, we, what we're working on. It has a number of different imaging modes on board uh, and a different set of polarizations that are allowing to look at different aspects for different applications. Uh, one of those modes is, uh, is actually this little one here called the wave mode and over the global ocean we have little imagettes that are sampled as the satellite flies because a radar needs a lot of energy to run and it gets very hot. 
uh, but you don't want it to cool down as well. So what we do is we use these little image jets to keep the radar warm, and at the same time we obtain little data sets that as oceanographers we can use to interpolate useful information. I've mentioned the currents, but this gives you an idea of what we will be able to do from Sentinel-3. Here you can see one element of the surface current in the Agulhas retroreflection region. Uh, and you can see, compared to altimeter data, which do actually measure the surface heights associated with that current, there's very, very good agreement. But you can also use the little image data to actually, with, um, with wave tracing, um, you can actually start to look at things like this, this that I show here, which is called fireworks, which is showing you where the energy is being imparted into the ocean uh, by storms. Uh, but you can see it's very, very useful information. It's somewhat qualitative at the moment, there's more work that needs to be done. But actually, it's still a measurement, and this can be helpful. Maybe this is the only measurement that we get, for whatever reason, and it can still be helpful. Um, Sentinel-1, just one of the satellites, will double the amount of information that we get compared to Envisat. This is the amount of samples that we can propagate over a day uh, from Envisat. And when we come to the first Sentinel-2, we get twice the amount. And of course we'll have two satellites on orbit at the same time, so you have four tons the amount of information here over the ocean every day. So this is pretty good sampling uh, for the open ocean. Sentinel-2, this is a, this is a um, high resolution uh, visible imager, so you need the sun, it's a daytime imager. Uh, it, can, it can be compared to Landsat, which you may have heard of before. And in fact, uh, Sentinel-2 provides one great big enormous high resolution swath compared to anything that's gone before. This is a pretty amazing piece of technology and really it will be fantastic. Um, and I say it'll be fantastic because a day, again, it is a two satellite constellation which means that you can have a revisit at the same place every five days. Now clouds get in the way, so you'll either see clouds or land, that's always a confounding feature. But assuming that you have a, a cloud situation, then you can, within a couple of days, obtain a before and after image of the, uh, of the coastal area that, you, um, that has been subject to storm surges. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about compared to everything that's gone before, the kind of sampling that you get here is really quite something. It really is quite amazing. Uh, different set of features, and this is the visible section down here, the visible channels here at 10 meters resolution, but there are channels right out here in the shortwave infrared that can be useful for both meteorology uh, and for oceanography. Systematic acquisition on a 10-day repeat cycle, uh, and so this data is all freely available within the Copernicus program to everyone. And indeed, one of the nice things about this mission, while it's focused on the land, uh, mission management has decided to also image uh, the coastal regions. So where there is a, a where the satellite measures a little bit of the, the land, but a lot of ocean, all that data will be systematically acquired. So this can become quite a nice workhorse instrument to look at coastal inundation. And the timeliness, the delivery timeliness of the data is pretty good. Here we have one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hours and six hours. So over much of Europe uh, and in certain areas where we have good reception on the ground from the satellite, we can download the data, a very, very good timeliness. Up to five hours in some of these areas here, but somewhere between one and three hours for delivery timeliness. Uh, there is a series of different data sets that will be provided, uh, what we call level 1B, which is the instrument level, right the way through to calibrated top of the atmosphere radiances, which can be used by algorithms and to, de to, to define whatever you want. Then we have um, Sentinel-3, this is a Darth Vader satellite, uh, but this is the workhorse satellite for oceanography. And here we are looking at sea surface height from the altimeter. Uh, we can use um, um, sea surface temperature and ocean color. We get the wind and waves, also land cover, and there are dedicated channels for fire monitoring on board here, which not so much of an interest for oceanographers, but when you have gas flares, extremely important over the ocean on, on oil rigs. Big heritage of the mission. A lot of information has gone into this. Um, Again, it's a two satellite constellation with very good coverage. Um, over one repeat cycle of 27 days, you sample the Earth completely with the two satellites. The separation here with uh, a, a two days is something around about 60 kilometers. A very wide swath instrumentation. Lots of products uh, that are available. So our job really is to try to understand how we can take all of this amazing information that's at your fingertips and to actually use it to exploit the science through new methods, 
um, through new application demonstrations, through new service developments, to develop new user requirements that we at the space agencies can use to develop new missions to serve your needs. That's what the European Space Agency is there for you. And for those of you that live in Europe, it is your space agency, collectively. So please help us to help you uh, get the most out of uh, our satellite assets for storm surge forecasting. Thank you.